So now we move on to our next speaker. So it's my pleasure to introduce Bianca Cipollaro. She's a research fellow with the Faculty uh, uh, at the University of Vita Santa, Vita Salute San Raffaele, <laughs> get it right. So she works in philosophy of language, in particular on uh, the evaluative language, including pejoratives and slurs, and uh, the, also the intersection between semantics and pragmatics. And she recently moved on addressing questions uh, of meta-ethics from, uh, from an experimental angle. And I think, uh, Bianca, that your book must be out by now. I... Yeah, let's advertise my book. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, um... so it's called um, Slurs and Thick Terms, and it came out with um, uh, Roman and Littlefield a few months ago. And yeah, and that's it. And then I, I'll just tell you what I'm going to talk about today. Excellent. So today you will speak about remedies to discriminatory contents uh, on an offline counter speech. So thank you very much, Mihaela. Thank you for uh, thank you for being here, and thanks to Mihaela for putting together um, this workshop. So I'm um, I'm sharing my slides, and please tell me if you see. Um, them properly right all right I'm going to good yeah can you see yes. um and and hear me fine good so hello again everyone so today i'm going to talk about um online as opposed to offline counter speech so i will start uh, by introducing a few preliminary notions concerning counter speech, and in particular, uh, Langton's notion of blocking as counter speech. I will focus on the costs of blocking, and uh, then I will move to online as opposed to offline counter speech. And I will um, illustrate what I think are the specificity of, um, of online counter speech, and I will. Um, walk you through the examples I collected in a qualitative studies on Italian Facebook and Twitter um, comments. And I will try to distinguish a few strategies that users uh, employ um, with the aim of seeing how these strategies relate to the theoretical notion of blocking. So let's start um, by saying something very general namely that counter speech in general is a second turn intervention aimed to contrast a previous contribution with which one does not agree. Now, many scholars focused on a, a narrower notion of counter speech, namely counter speech addressing toxic speech rather than merely false speech. And some scholars, including Langton, uh, narrowed the focus even more um, to focus on counter speech addressing implicit rather than explicit toxic speech. So speech conveying toxic contents via implicature, presupposition and the like. And this does not really um, come as a surprise because, well, there is something about implicit speech. So implicit toxic speech um, sorry, implicit toxic contents are particularly dangerous because they can go under the radar, they are hard to question, and they may have um, being accepted in the um, common ground without the conversation participants fully realizing it. Now, this danger of implicit toxic speech increases even more when these mechanisms are exploited on purpose to deliberately smuggle in contents that people wouldn't necessarily be willing to openly commit to. So the question arises, how can we counter implicit toxic speech? Um, recently, Langton has introduced us to the notion of blocking, a form of counter speech specifically tailored to address implicit um, toxic speech. So it consists in spelling out and challenging the objectionable content implicitly conveyed by a given utterance. Now, in doing so, 
blocking prevents the toxic content from entering the common ground by default. Um, now, in, a, in an idealized model, blocking consists of two parts. So on the one hand, we have spelling out, unpacking, making explicit, articulating. And then on the other hand, we have challenging, questioning, rejecting, disputing, confronting. Now note how the first move is cognitively costly because it's hard to unpack implicit content on the spot right away. The second move on the other hand is socially costly because it's tough to interrupt the flow of the conversation. It can be tough to go and take a confrontational attitude. In fact, um, sometimes the option of confronting one's interlocutor is simply not socially acceptable. Um, another problematic aspect is that the social cost of counter speech is not distributed, so to say, evenly. So um, there are many studies in um, social psychology uh, that have been run in the last couple of decades um, that tell us that found the following. They found that when targets counter a discriminatory remark, they are perceived as complainers to a greater extent than when non-targets do. Um, even more, so non-targets, on the other hand, tend to be perceived positively by others when they do intervene. So there, there, we see a kind of double standard in the social costs of country speech in general. And we may expect this to apply to blocking as well, to the specific case of blocking as well. Finally, we also, we also the studies uh, tell us that uh, non-targets also seem more uh, effective in the sense that perpetrators report feeling more guilty uh, about their discriminatory utterance when confronted by a known target. Now, what shall we conclude from the fact that known targets seem more effective in country speech, they seem to avoid social costs, and they actually seem to gain social benefits instead? Now, it's tempting to conclude that in virtue of their privilege and effectiveness, known targets have a special duty to intervene against discriminatory speech. Um, let's say something about this uh, tempting conclusion. One thing is that if known targets take on the duty to counter toxic speech, they may indeed ease the pressure on targets to defend themselves all the time and spare them the social costs of confronting. Um, one may say that counteracting discrimination can be seen as a collective enterprise, given that privileges and disadvantages combine in complex ways and a single person can count as privilege in certain contexts and disadvantage in others. However, as you may already um, see um, there, we, there is a huge risk of paternalism because targets rather than non-targets know better what kind of linguistic and non-linguistic actions are discriminating against them. So they should have their voices heard. Now, um, before um, wrapping up, um, what I want to say about the costs of um, country speech in general and possibly blocking in particular, let me, um, let me open a very brief parenthesis about a further risk for blocking. So blocking may run the risk of raising the salience of the toxic contents that it aims to reject. So uh, think of Robert Simpson's idea of unringing the bell. Um, think of what Mitra, um, in a recent talk, Mitra uh, made some remarks about uh, the fact that blocking um, relates in a very special way to the question under discussion. Now, whether it's the case 
that blocking raises the salience of the toxic content that it aims to reject is for me an empirical question that needs to be addressed on empirical ground. So, and, and this is the teaser part. To this end, I've been running um, some studies with um, two social psychologists, uh, Fabio Fazzoli from the University of Surrey and Andrea Carnaghi from the University of Trieste. And I uh, very much look forward to uh, telling you about our results when, when we have it, when, when we are ready, sometime in the close future. So, but, but now let's, let's recap a second uh, and say that the social costs of country speech in general and blocking in particular are not evenly distributed, but weighed upon targets who pay the highest price for speaking up. Um, other studies such as Rezinski and Zop and Dichter and colleague and her colleagues found that the targets of the offense tend to avoid engaging in counter speech because they fear negative repercussions. And, uh, and again, this is not surprising in light of what we were seeing before. And bystanders are quite reluctant to. As for the cognitive costs, Engaging in blocking requires one to be focused, very aware, ready to confront by saying really the right thing at the right time. So in light of this, one may wonder, do people actually engage in blocking in their daily life? This mechanism clearly works in abstract idealized model, but um, is it really widespread? So. With this question in mind, um, I started looking at um, what people were doing on social media. So I can now move to um, talking about online as opposed to offline counter speech. And I'd like to start by highlighting what I think are the specificities that characterize online counter speech. So certain features of how communication works on social networks make social media particularly interesting venues to observe in a kind of easy way um, real instances of counter speech in ecological contexts. So I will focus on these four uh, points concerning asynchrony, anonymity, identity, and broad reach versus isolation. So let's start with asynchrony. Now for blocking to succeed in face-to-face -face interactions, uh, the counter speaker needs to be, as we said, ready to intervene, saying the right thing in the right place at the right moment. On social networks, on the other hand, blocking can well be asynchronous. So this may hopefully lighten the cognitive load associated with blocking. And now we may wonder, mm, fine, but that was the cognitive load, but what about the social uh, costs? So um, we, may we may make two contrasting observations. The first one is that social network users enjoy a bit of anonymity in their online interventions. Plus online interactions uh, follow a kind of different etiquette than face-to-face -face exchanges because there isn't really such a thing as interrupting the flow of the conversation. So this may possibly lighten the social cost associated with blocking. On the other hand though, um, online interactions expose people to specific dangers, right? Like online hate campaigns and this kind of phenomena. So online blocking could have actually finally higher social costs um, in another sense, in other ways. The issue of anonymity leads us to the question of identity. So recall what we've just said about how the identity of the counter speaker modulates their effectiveness and the social cost or benefit associated with counter speech. Now, even though online communication provides some anonymity, as, as we just said, social network profiles, I'm thinking of picture and username, 
can in principle reveal interesting and meaningful pieces of information about users. So think of usernames. Well, they don't have to, but they may convey information about one's gender, one's origins, one's ethnicity, nationality, even marital status in certain uh, cases. And as the same goes for pictures, they don't have to, but they may reveal gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation, and relationship status if we uh, imagine that one has a picture with their partner, or even occupation. Um, in some cases, if I am a medical doctor and my profile picture, it's me in the hospital with um, um, my stethoscope, etc. So, so this is to say that everything that we know about how identity modulates effectiveness and, and social costs um, is going to adapt in, in, in peculiar ways when it comes to social networks as opposed to face-to-face -to -face interactions. Um, another point, I, the last point I want to mention um, is, is this. Online counter speech, um, one may say, can reach many more people than offline interventions, obviously. And, and in fact, um, users often, and, and this, we will see this in the examples I will show you, users often uh, challenge offline contents, like stuff they found on a newspaper or pieces of public speech or reported conversations, passages of textbooks and so on. They um, challenge these offline contents on social networks. And the idea is that by, by doing that on a social network, uh, they would give their conversational move more attention. However, um, online epistemic bubbles, and even more so for eco chambers, isolate users. So we know that algorithms um, prioritize contents that are in accordance with our beliefs, feelings and attitudes. So the worry um, that, that, that we see here is that online counter speech, especially occurring on pages that are only visible to users who are already following them, uh, tends to reach those who didn't really need it and fails to come to those who mostly need it. So the worry here is that uh, what we may sort of take for granted, namely that um, online counter speech would reach more people, um, might turn out wrong because of epistemic bubbles, because of eco chambers. Now, as an offset to this worry, consider though that online counter speech, even if um, it only reached bubbles of individuals sharing common values could help people belonging to discriminated groups to feel the solidarity and the protection of an active and engaged community. Um, plus, as a side note, let me add that in the case of internalized self-loathe, the exercise of spotting, unpacking and rejecting implicit discriminatory contents can actually be helpful even when it's not really aimed at convincing interlocutors. Um, so this said um, about specificities of online as opposed to offline counter speech, let me move to, uh, let me show you some examples and uh, strategies. So, as I, as I announced at the beginning, I conducted a qualitative study on um, Facebook and Twitter in Italian to see if users commonly engage in country speech. In particular, I wanted to see if blocking uh, was a customary strategy and what other strategies in the vicinity could be observed. Um, before um, going to and, and see the examples, let me say uh, the, the data, let me say that with the qualitative study, I couldn't measure the psychological efficacy of country speech, nor the virality of it. 
but we can, in some cases at least, observe the number of reactions and shares that a certain um, comment obtained. So I divided the strategies in three groups. The first one is blocking and phenomena somehow in its vicinity. Uh, then we'll move to correction, which um, as um, I'll try to show, has some relation to blocking as well. And finally, irony and derision. So let's start from these examples. So um, I should say, the exam because we have country speech, as you imagine, the kind of things you're going to see are not exactly um, nice. Um, people felt like intervening because bad things were going on. So, Take this example. Um, it's from October 2019. So the old world before everything happened. Um, two Italian young men are brought to trial for raping a young woman in a club in London. La Repubblica, a national newspaper, quotes the defendant's lawyer. And the quote goes as follows. These are guys from good families who, like anyone else at their age, responded to the explicit propositions of a peer of theirs. So um, we observe that the expression, the explicit propositions, works as a presuppositional trigger. In particular, it triggers the presupposition that the victim made explicit propositions. This presupposition, in turn, generates the inference that the young women consented to intercourse, at least initially. And by the way, if you pair this inference with the dangerous and widespread assumption that initial consent is consent, um, you, obtain, you, conclude, you would conclude that this woman was not raped. So I started looking at the comments um, on Facebook to the article from this um, newspaper. And I find, I mean, there, there were many were very interesting. I'm going to talk about this one, uh, which the day after it was posted had already 231 reactions. Uh, and I'm going to focus on two parts, the one you see underlined. In the first part, I translated it, of course. Um, in the first part, the user unpacks the implicit content. She says, the lawyer's words perfectly reflect the belief widespread in our country, like she was drunk and she asked for it. And then she goes and rejects, and, and rejects it. She says, a drunk girl does not consent to sex. So here we see the two moments of blocking there separately. Um, consider uh, another example. A few days ago, um, the same newspaper, um, La Repubblica, described um, a person as a young man suffering from autism. Now suffering from, in Italian, it was affetto da, is the verb that introduces illnesses. So the phrase implicitly takes a pathologizing perspective on autism that many people do not share, for instance, people in the neuro neurodiversity movement. So I started looking at the comments and I found um, this that um, seemed uh, quite interested, interesting. So this user says, we don't say suffering from autism. Autism is not a disease. Weren't we supposed to choose words carefully? Now, this is a more concise form of blocking because in one single sentence, autism is not a disease, the implicit content conveyed by suffering from is articulated, autism being an illness, and rejected. She says autism is not a disease. So, as we said, in idealized blocking, we have just two moments of unpacking and rejecting. 
uh, we saw that they can be in fact separated. Sometimes they um, appear together, like in the last example. But online, we also find many instances of what of something I call demi blocking, the practice of uh, basically performing just one half of blocking, the practice of unpacking the implicit content without challenging it, challenging it explicitly, but only tacitly. So take this uh, example. Um, October 2019, uh, the same newspaper as before interviews a woman who was involved in parties held at Berlusconi's place. These parties were suspected of prostitution exploitation. The woman says, in my little town, I've been labeled as a prostitute, I've been bullied, I couldn't get out of my place, I suffered from depression and anorexia. Now, around the same time when the newspaper published the interview, a party, a political party close to Berlusconi's won the election in Umbria, a region in central Italy. Now, these two facts are obviously unrelated, but a user, but I, I need to, to tell you about both because a user commented on the interview from the women involved in the parties at Berlusconi's as follows. He said, and apparently Umbria is full of women and girls who wish they were in her place. And a user, who by the way is a philosopher, replied, are you saying that all the female right-wing electors would like to have sex for money? She didn't, um, she didn't need to reject the implicit content. It was sort of enough for her to articulate what the first comment was implicitly conveying. So only half of the two, only half blocking was performed. And nevertheless, we may expect it to be uh, effective or not. I mean, we, we will discuss more about this. Now, in addition to uh, perfect blocking and demi blocking, uh, if we want to keep the ballet um, parallel, we can call it uh, grand blocking and demi blocking. Only, um, so on, online, we, we found many instances of the practice of consisting of urging a user to make what they mean explicit, only implying that what we think they are suggesting is implicit, is suspicious. Let's see an example. So, um, sorry, let me characterize it a, a little bit better and then I'll show you an example. So this, can, this, um, this practice I, I just sketched can be seen as a form of proto-blocking, uh, consisting in urging the interlocutor to engage in the first step required for blocking, or we could say urging the interlocutor to engage in demi-blocking, namely unpacking, basically. Now, uh, interestingly, this proto-blocking shifts the burden of unpacking the implicit content from the counter speaker to the tox back to the toxic speaker. Um, we may ask, we may wonder, what about rejecting? Does it do any rejecting? Not explicitly, once again. So it conveys only tacitly that the alleged implicit content may be problematic. So, so if we, if yeah, no, let's see the, the example first. So um, this is the this is the case in November two thousand nineteen. The French actress uh, Adèle Haenel reve reveals on a French television show, uh, Mediapart, that the, di that the film director she used to work with when she was between 12 and 15, uh, Christophe Rouja, harassed her back then. Adèle uh, Haenel shared her story with few people uh, about three years after the harassment. And only many years later, in 2019, she went public. Um, so the, um, the uh, newspaper uh, Liberation 
published um, an article about this story and I, I uh, tried to see how people commented on it. And I found this um, um, exchange, I'm going to translate it, uh, that seems interesting um, with respect to this idea of proto-blocking. So the first user says, for three years, you said nothing to your parents, nor anyone. And we know that this is a very notorious argument to um, um, like question the credibility of victims. And interestingly, another user just says, and? So an and is enough to urge the original speaker to write or user in this case to make clear what they were trying to say. Like, are you trying to say that uh, she's not telling the truth? And once the original speaker was forced to make clear whether she was um, suggesting this or not, uh, she replied, I have a hard time telling myself that one can undergo such an experience without talking about it, and for three years. Now, urging speakers to make what they meant explicit gives them the chance to rethink what they meant, leaving room for deniability. And we see at least two ways in which things can go. So if they disavow, the implicit content that they initially seem to have conveyed, um, this doesn't enter the common ground. But if they stand by it, then it will be clearer for, inter for everyone else how to address such contents. In fact, imagine that if the, the first user uh, said something like, in response to the end, from the second one, if she said something like, uh, and I don't think she's telling us the truth, then people could have uh, rejoined and um, properly articulate what was wrong with that. Bianca, sorry to interrupt. I think we are uh, kind of keeping the, the talk too long and we'll have very little time for Q&A, so. We so like didn't we didn't we start and at ten past? Oh, you're right. Yeah, it was ten past. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. No problem. Um, I'm towards the end, but I yeah, I think I will use my ten extra minutes. Okay, so um, last couple of, of strategies. One is correction. So when we correct a term or an utterance we implicitly, we do two things. We, impli at least, we implicitly communicate that something was wrong with the initial formulation. So this would correspond to in blocking, to what in blocking we call rejection. And we leave it to our audience to figure out what was wrong exactly. So what used to, what we used to call articulation when talking about blocking. So we may legitimately ask ourselves whether correction is also in the vicinity of blocking or not. So I will show you some examples and then we will go back to this question. Um, it's the same, it's the same um, article from um, Liberation about same story, Adèle la, 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 you remember? And, and the newspaper uh, in a passage says, blah, 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 her account of her youth as an actress that she almost screwed up because of her relationship with the filmmaker Christophe Ruccia. And um, I, I went and see the comments and found uh, this comment by a user who said, because of her relationship with the film director, seriously? We talk about sexual harassment and assault in this case, nothing to do with the relationship. Be careful with the words you choose, but are not innocuous. What's interesting here um, is that the uh, user clearly rejects uh, the idea 
in this case, it's not even, um, it's not even, so it, she, she rejects the explicit content, namely that an underage uh, girl had a relationship with uh, grown up men. She clearly rejects it. She corrects it. So she says, what we should be talking about in this case is sexual harassment and assault. But she doesn't articulate what was wrong with calling this a relationship. So in this case, we see that correction does something similar to blocking, but not really to full-fledged blocking or ground blocking, as, as we can say. Um, online, we find even more concise and visual, so to say, forms of correction. Um, uh, take this, I don't know if we can call it a meme or, but um, here the author invites us or actually invites newspapers to instead of going for headlines like strangles a prostitute for, he for a headline like strangles a woman and instead of victim of a criminal love they should say so the author says victim of a criminal uh, instead of killed by a raptus uh, it would be it should be killed by a man in a similar spirit, uh, you have other um, interventions, um, something like, so here they say, I don't understand why the headline of newspapers is baby prostitutes in Ventimiglia rather than pedophile, cl pedophile clients in Ventimiglia. So, um, we go back to our initial question, namely, is correction in the vicinity of blocking? Uh, and we observe that while the rejection part is clear, and sometimes it's even visually clear, think of the, the red line, it is somehow left to the reader to figure out what was wrong with the initial formulation. How can we figure out? Well, we contrast the old formulation the new formulation and we try to see what changes not just in terms of the um, uh, asserted content so explicit content but in terms of its uh, implicit content and connotations so let's see the last kind of strategy i observed um, in this qualitative study um, irony and derision now with the strategy of irony and derision users leave it to the readers to figure out what was wrong with the contribution that they are making fun of. So um, what, used to, what we used to call unpacking. And they also leave it to the readers to figure out that they are being ironical so that their attitude towards the above content is dissociative, what we may call rejection. Now, this obviously exposes um, users to a higher risk of being misunderstood. But on the other hand, they also present themselves as funnier and less pedantic than those engaging in blocking and correction as we have observed them. So let me show you a couple of examples. August 2019, a 45-year-old man, more than a 28-year-old, uh, gay women who had rejected him. Il Giornale, a right-wing national newspaper, shares on Twitter an article about this and comments as follows. They say, the good giant and the unrequited love. Let me say that again. They really said, the good giant and the unrequited love. Um, oh, under that uh, article, I found very interesting comments, but I only selected um, a few to illustrate how irony would be used. So there was this comment um, where the use of dialect, which went lost in my translation, adds to the sarcasm. The comment said, likely he is good. Imagine if he had been bad, what would have he done? Eaten her up? What a bunch of jerks. So here we have the region, the region plus some insults. And, and of course, much more could be said about the use of 
emojis. Um, another user uh, goes for irony too and just says, and Hitler was just a landscape painter in love with dogs, of course. So in these cases, uh, once again, if, if we compare these cases to the previous one, both moments that we found in blocking are somehow left to the reader to figure out. The reader has to figure out uh, what exactly was wrong with what is being um, made fun of. And they also have to figure out that the writer is, that the user is being ironic so that they are actually rejecting the content they are um, responding to. So um, I presented these three strategies, first family blocking, then demi-blocking, proto-blocking, and then correction and irony and derision. To recap, after a few preliminaries on blocking and its cost, I um, moved to online counter speech and underlined some specificities of it, focusing on asynchrony, anonymity, identity, and broad reach versus isolation. And finally, I uh, walked you through the examples, some of the examples I collected um, in order to point out certain interesting strategies. So I hope that this overview of online counter speech can help us illuminate the nature and working of this phenomenon with a special focus on how the theoretical notion of blocking can be applied to real, even though virtual, interactions. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Bianca, for a wonderful talk. So now we open the floor for questions. So you can put them in the chat. That would be the easiest way for me to pick them up rather than scrolling to, to check if everyone has a question. And uh, yeah, you can also raise it. Uh, I see uh, Ray Langton. Oh, thank you, Bianca. That was a really lovely talk. Thanks so much. And it's good to see you here. It's good to see everyone else here as well. Um, I just wanted to um, um, ask about whether you think of these efforts at blocking, um, including irony and um, yeah, sarcasm and the use of dialect and all of these different things, um, um, as forms of blocking in the sense of exposing a presupposition that's faulty, um, even though they are not following the method of explicitation, which is a certain paradigm case of blocking. So, you know, um, you can think that the paradigm case of blocking a presupposition, um, blocking the accommodation of a presupposition, is what Marina Spizar calls explicitation, namely spelling the whole thing out and saying, wait a minute, uh, wait a minute, I didn't know you had a sister, or wait a minute, you know, and spelling out um, the, what the presupposition is of those horrible things, they're amazing set of examples you've got. Um, I was thinking that these, that, um, that um, jokes and irony and sarcasm um, all do, do, do you, I, do you, think that they are all um, doing the same job, they're just doing it in a cleverer, funnier way. Um, so they're more effective. Um, I just would like some feedback on that and connecting this with the broader phenomenon of pre presupposition accommodation and the blocking of presupposition accommodation. Thank you very much. Thank you. So um, I, I think that if we analyze them um, along the same line. So if we, if we want to say, yes, these are for specific form, uh, forms of blocking, um, we have to be very careful in analyzing um, a few things. One is that they are very risky moves. I've been uh, finding so many instances of misunderstood irony online. So they are extremely dangerous in this sense. And, um, from, and like from what I think is more interesting from a theoretical point of view is that we observed a shift of the burden of figuring things out from the counter speaker to the reader. 
So it is the reader who has to do all the job of figuring out what was wrong and what kind of attitude the writer is, is um, holding and expressing. So if we want them to be in the family of blocking, then we will need to distinguish carefully between different kinds of moves within blocking, each of which will have not only their mechanisms, but also their, their risks. And they will, put, they will uh, allocate burden, different kinds of burdens on different sides. So I, I, I may think it would be very interesting to, to do so. Thanks. You're muted. We have a question. From, yeah, <laughs> we have a question from Chris Cousins. Um, hi, thanks very much for a, a really interesting talk. I, I was wondering if you might, I don't know if this is sort of entirely within the scope, if you might be able to say a little bit more about the online phenomenon, right, as opposed to you know, the more sort of paradigm cases of blocking, which have a really clear conversational context or you know, a common ground or a, um, a conversational score that something might be blocked from getting into. Whereas these online conversations don't seem to have the same, uh, the same structure, especially some of these uh, initial responses to a newspaper article being posted. Uh, the, the journalist presumably won't read most of these comments. So it, the, yeah, uh, I, I agree certainly that blocking something like very much like the paradigm case of blocking is going on here but i was wondering if that online uh, mode of conversing might require a different mechanism to explain it or might uh, you know have some effect on the way that we understand what the blocker is doing yeah thank you very much chris uh, very interesting question and this is uh, indeed a very problematic point mainly because as you as you said we cannot just apply the notion of common ground as we know it um among the many complications you have not only that in the moment where you write you don't have uh, a, you, you don't really know who are the participants to the conversation but also because according to um, like those who intervene might then just drop out so um, so this this poses very hard um, difficulties however um, we can say, well, we have like two ways to go. One is to use an idealized model of um, common ground and imagine a conversation where you're speaking and people come and go all the time. Um, and then, um, or give up and say, no, no, this requires a completely different model and we don't, we have no idea how it works, etc. If we go for the former one and we say, okay, so let's let's simplify things and consider an idealized model of online conversation where people come and go and you don't really know who will be out there. Um, we can just add a tiny detail, namely that when you write a comment, then you receive a notification every time someone else says something about it. So there is a sense in which social networks are designed in a way that keeps you involved in the conversation where you took part. So I know this is a very partial answer, but um, yeah, I, I don't have a definite answer about that. Thanks very much. We have a question from Louis. Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Uh, first of all, thanks for the for the talk. Um, so I think one one thing that might be interesting to additionally look at in these uh, online study or in these studies on online blocking are uh, trolls, which or who might play a quite interesting and destructive role in these uh, discussions. So just one example, maybe the the cognitive costs for blocking trolls uh, might be much higher because they are just, yeah, they just uh, bullshitting around or uh, uh, are heavily provocative and so on. Uh, so my question would be, did you, did you consider uh, such cases in your studies? And um, uh, maybe another question would be, should we also block these trolls just as we try to block like, uh, real Thank you very much. 
Um, I'm so I start from the end. I think that probably trying to in in the um, in this conversational sense, trolls is exactly what they try what they want us to do, right? So they they want us to um, get scandalized about what they say and 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 intervene and just um, go on and on like that. So 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 I I have no idea, but I would answer no. Like blocking them is a waste of time. Um, what we can do is label them as trolls, and this may uh, avoid that what they say enters the common ground with the same uh, kind of credibility that any other contribution is uh, granted by default. Um, so in the, in the kind of um, material I was analyzing, I didn't find any uh, troll intervention from trolls. Um, I'm now thinking, was it because maybe they were um deleted but but in fact most of the time i was taking a screenshot maybe you noticed like um the day the comment was made or a few hours after so um i haven't been so much exposed to trolls but i think that um, research specifically on this phenomenon could 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 find many interesting things thanks a lot thank you so we're getting quite a lot of questions and I would uh, urge you to keep it short to the point and, and okay, your response as well. So, um, Alessandra. Hi. Hi. Alessandra. Hi. Hi. Thank you. Really interesting. So I have a question that I think is analogous to the question of the common ground, but it's slightly different. So communication experts talk of uh, um, communication on uh, social networking sites as cases of collapsed contexts. Uh, uh, so what that means is that often is the case that the speaker and the, and the audience uh, uh, are lack a lot of the contextual information uh, that might be fully required to understand the speech act. And so this phenomenal collapse contest, for instance, is thought to be responsible for why anger is so prevalent online. Uh, it strikes me that in the context of what you're talking about, it might make it possible to misread uh, the implicit consent of the speech act much more easily. And, and therefore, for instance, to miss irony completely. Uh, and so uh, this is more mm. common than a question. It seems to me that the context of collapse contexts makes a big difference to uh, how effective blocking can be online and how it is possible to get it wrong. So to misread what is the implicit content of a speech act. Thank you very much. Let me distinguish between two scenarios where things uh, go wrong. In the first scenarios, people do not get, because of the lack of common context, people do not get the implicit content and they were just fine. So someone was trying to smuggle in some discriminatory stuff and they, they couldn't because no one understood, fine. But let's now look at the other case where the case where uh, what you were saying was not discriminatory at all and, and you're somehow accused of having been discriminatory because people didn't get what you meant. I, I've, I've seen some case, some such cases. Um, um, in these cases, um, I'm not sh like, I don't know whether we would say that blocking was ineffective because it seems that you are blocking nothing. You're blocking something that didn't need to be blocked because it was not there in the first place. So in these cases, what I've observed, I have a couple of examples in mind. One, I also had slides, but I didn't use them, um, was a case where people started discussing whether there were this implicit problematic content or not in a given utterance. Um, and they were like, simply disagreeing, like some would say, yeah, 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 this implies this and that. And the other was saying, where are you seeing that you're hallucinating? There is no such thing, etc." But from the point of view of blocking, what's interesting is that the moment you discuss this, whether the thing was there or not, it doesn't enter the common ground by default, right? Yeah, but I think more about that. Thank you very much. Uh, next question from Rob. Thanks, Bianca. That was a really interesting talk. Um, I thought you were going to maybe come back at the end to the really interesting tension that you outlined at the beginning, where you were talking about this 
what 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 do we want from bystanders? You know, sometimes um, being the one to do the blocking seems like sharing the burden, but other times it seems like um, somehow being condescending or white knighting or something like that. And I thought maybe in light of the more nuanced taxonomy of forms of um, blocking and counter speech that you gave us, you were perhaps going to have a suggestion about what forms of blocking or counter speech were more appropriate or more likely to be appropriate for bystanders. Um, so I was wondering whether, yeah, I guess I just want to invite you to speak on that. I thought maybe you were going to say something like that um, there's, there's a kind of, I don't know what the right word for it is, but almost workmanlike way of doing blocking where you, uh, maybe that's a, a strange word for it. Or like a workmanlike way of doing right. it, where there's no sense of like trying to be stylish or gain social credit, but you're just saying, you said this thing, this thing had the following kind of implicit or not at issue content, that's false. And doing that in a very kind of straightforward way, which doesn't try to gain social credit beyond just like saying, hey, here's what's going on here. Yeah, thank you very much. So I, I think that um, the problem, the reason why a non-target uh, get social credibility is not the way they intervene, but simply the fact that they don't have uh, a huge amount of prejudice waiting on them. So whatever they say, they're going to be more effective, more credible and look nicer. But what I did find online and I really liked was a case where a guy was speaking against um, a sexist comment and instead of saying, instead of mansplaining how the comment was sexist, he quoted uh, of, um, a woman who, so I actually uh, found two. In one, the user was quoting the words from a woman, and I thought that was brilliant. Um, and another case, a guy was posting an article from a woman speaking about the phenomena, phenomenon he, he thought he was seeing. That was interesting too. So the idea would be you do an intervention, you do intervene because you know that your intervention has is, is effective and doesn't really have so, I mean, the costs are quite low or you might even have benefits, but you do that by relying on the discriminated group's words instead of putting there your own. I thought that was very interesting. I also think that's really hard to do. Um, I mean, to, to find, I think it's hard to, find appropriate ways to do that. Thanks. We, are, we have a question from Rebecca, Rebecca, and then he gone. Thank you. Thank you so much for this talk. Um, I was wondering, thinking about Roy Langton's um, ideas about blocking, I was wondering if in the cases that you've identified, like proto-blocking and demi-blocking and correction, whether you see those as having the potential to um, when Langton discusses it, you know, sort of undo or prevent the speech act by making it misfire um, or like by removing hero-based felicity conditions. I was wondering if you thought that these forms that you've identified also have that potential or whether they are sort of an earlier stage that doesn't necessarily have the ability to kind of um, undo the elocutionary act that maybe does something that kind of brings us towards that point. Thank you very much. This is a very uh, important question. So uh, yes, I do definitely think that they do have the potentials, in, the potential. In fact, in many cases, um, I think that it, it, especially for instance, in demi blocking, it, it was absolutely unnecessary to say that the writer was not um, um, endorsing that uh, girls and women in Umbria uh, wanted to be prostitutes or what was exactly the, the, the implicit content. So, but, but what's interesting is that I think it, making it explicit was enough to block it. There are other cases, however, in which partly because of this lack of, con of context Alessandra was talking about, um, these forms of imperfect blocking expose the, um, the user to a higher risk of being misunderstood and of, of, of simply failing. So I think that they definitely have the potential. Um, they just involve higher risks. And, and, by the, and, and, and we should be clear about what are the benefits instead, because a benefit could be be less pedantic, um, but it's unclear whether the benefit um, overcome the costs or the risks. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Right. We are kind of out of time, but we can still continue if uh, people are interested. So we have one last question from Hugo. We keep it short. Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. So um, you noted that the asynchronous and um, anonymous nature of online counter speech can reduce the uh, the social and the cognitive loads on the, the counter speaker. But um, I wondered if the the, the online conditions which produce these effects might also lessen the effectiveness of the counter speech. So, you know, because you're anonymous, um, people people are sort of less less inclined to listen to you, or because you're because of the asynchronousness, people are less likely even to notice your comment. Um, and I wondered in general if if there might be a a, a connection, like a direct relationship between uh, identity and anonymity, perhaps. Um, and synchronous or asynchronous conversation and um, the effectiveness of counter speech. I was thinking of situations where like, you know, if you're, I don't know, if the issue under discussion is, is racism, um, one might sacrifice some of one's anonymity online um, if one is of the race under discussion to bring kind of weight to, to one's point of view. So, well, I'm, I'm black and I, I think this, if that's what's under discussion. Um, and that might make your point more effective. Um, I yeah, I just wondered what you what you might think of the connection. Thank you very much. So I haven't really thought about the connection between effectiveness and uh, synchrony. So I'm definitely going to look into that. Um, I do think that the, the that it's perfectly possible that the same mechanisms that that may alleviate some costs may also. Uh, reduce effectiveness um, depending on basically who is going to um, read the comment because if you for instance if you do make a comment then you will receive a notification if someone else does but if you just read something you will not so um, even though well you know that stuff that got lots of comments get read um, uh, get priority and and all of that but, but still this may perfectly happen um, so it's true that this kind of counter speech does not um, reach everyone. On the other hand, there are, um, shall we call them institutions? Well, it's not really institutional, but there are pages, for instance, who are very much devoted to the practice of counter speech. And um, what they do is taking problematic pieces of uh, discourse from newspapers and the media and um, make clear how they are problematic and confront them, etc. And they do them on the page. So basically, instead of being exposed to the first product, so to say, to the first object, you are directly exposed to the counter speech. Then, of course, the problem arises, and this we briefly discussed it, um, that the fact that those who will be exposed to this kind of counter speech are those who are already following certain pages, which means they're already already sharing certain values. So that's definitely, yeah, I think that's very problematic. Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you again, Bianca, for all your questions. wonderful questions and suggestions. Um, it's, it has been very, very helpful. Thanks a lot. Thank you. So we reconvene in six minutes, I'm afraid. <laughs> And I'm afraid I'll, I apologize.